Lord, all across this place, we thank you that your fresh fire is upon us so that we can be a good witness and burn up the schools in our neighborhoods that the young ones that are in here will not walk in timid and when we go into the business marketplace when we go into every circle of influence we are lit with your fresh fire to be an effective witness why cry out for the fire you say if you're never going to share if you're never going to talk about me if you're never going to say something to light a match and to light a flame into someone else that is dormant that needs a fresh touch lord we want to walk and be an influence for you and when the devil sees us with a fresh fire he's gonna know i don't want that smoke some of you guys need a stoke of the fire to be an effective witness to really bring a hesitation to the kingdom of darkness that where you tread where you stomp where you walk the devil has to flee he has to move lord you see hearts right now ablaze you see mindsets that are maybe locked with the stronghold let your fire come through and take those things out because when the word is preached today i pray that would go on soil that will root deep that will grow fruit and fruit that will remain so thank you for the work thank you for the clearing out of the old and for the fresh word to come in today in your precious name and all of God's wonderful children give them a big amen this morning and a clap and welcome to ProSite Church here at Kapole. you may be seated at this time Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to our youth. Thank you to our worship team. Our worship team, they practice really, really hard, okay, throughout the month so that we can get into his presence, so that we can get into a place of course, corporate worship and giving God our adoration. And Ray and I crashed their party, man. We crashed their party they had on Friday. They had a karaoke thing that they wanted to just have some fun and bond together and then we got in there and we realized really really quick that we don't we shouldn't go to karaoke places with people that can actually sing you're like trying to grab the mic and say, ah, probably not there's gonna be um some uh judgment going on but it wasn't like that so we're just so grateful for them we're so grateful that you're here today i see many faces and because there's so many faces we got you a special treat a sweet treat to beat the heat. Rhymes are coming out already, so I'm already in the fresh fire and the fresh flow. We have this acai bowl company that has this little nice little thing, cabana deal, and though the bowls don't fit Abu and I's stature, okay, you only can get one, because I think we ordered enough exactly for every one of you. They'll give you a ticket when you guys go, and then you just enjoy, just talk story outside a little bit. Want to talk story with you if we've never really had a conversation, and I'm so blessed that you're here today. So buckle your seat belts as we're in part two of our fundamental series, the basic fundamentals of walking with God, and we speak it every day, is to know God to follow God, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference by helping others do the same, and to knock it out of the part this week on week two of following God. I'd like to bring up my brother, Coach Abu Ma'afala. Give it up, uh, give it up for him right now. Okay, I'm going to turn my back because every time I get up here, you guys know I say the same thing to start. So I'm going to let you guys be like my team. Get yourself set. So when I turn around, we're ready to go. Okay, can we do that? Okay, okay, okay. So you already know, flat, feet flat on the ground. Sit up in your chair. Okay, good morning, church. How are we doing? There we go. Look at that. We're learning. Yes, we're getting coached up here. Uh, again, so glad to be here this morning um, and be able to share the word of God. Um, God is moving. He is here in this place. How many of you know that? Amen? Amen. That, that, and, and the spirit is needed because we need it. 
We are in the end days, and the Bible said that he's going to pour out his spirit on his people. And so I'm so excited because Pastor Wade here kicked off the series Fundamentals last week with Eye to Eye. Who was blessed with his word last week? It was unbelievable. I mean, talking about getting in your word and, and, and relating the story with Moses and being able to call God a friend and get, get that aloha, right? And I don't know if his story was embellished. I'm not sure if it, was, if it was Ray that wanted to skip to the end or if homeboy over here wanted to skip to the end. You know what I mean? But it was an amazing illustration of where we as believers want to get to, right? We want to be a, we, we as in the Western world, we want to skip everything and get to the good part, right? But the best part of his whole wedding there was to be able to have him and his wife embraced, breathing each other's air. And that's where we want to get to, church. Amen? So I'm going to speak about, uh, he said eye to eye. The title of my message today is, you, you ready for it? Hand in hand. Pastor, wait, we're working with it now. Come on, we're vibing, dog. You know what I mean? Let's go. And so it's just awesome because fundamentals, teaching fundamentals, is what I do on a daily basis in the job that I do, right? So every day at practice, we have this thing called a practice script, right? And my job is to organize the script in order to help our coaches and our players uh, reach their fullest potential, all right? And any good coach will know here, right? You can't get to all of the fancy stuff until you what, Coach Joe? You get what down? Get the fundamentals down, all right? And so... This, this great coach, I uh, was reading an article, and he talked about how he breaks up his practice time, and it really stuck with me because it's important because there's two things in anything, if you want to be good at it, that you're going to practice every day. There's two ways that you got to do it. Number one, you got to know how to do it, right? That is the fundamentals that we talk about. And then once you start get, nailing down those fundamentals, all right, you have to learn what to do, all right? So how to do and what to do. What to do is, in, in the athletic world, it's the plays that you run, right? Learning your plays, learning how to run it. Uh, you know, and in practice, it's in a, in a controlled environment, right? Because the pinnacle for us in football is once a week, in a game, everything that you've done for, throughout the whole week, it gets, it gets applied in the game, all right? And so what he said was, not, not only did he say those two things needed to happen, fundamentals, learning the technique, and then learning your plays, but there was a specific split in which he did it, right? He said that if you had 100 minutes of practice, okay, 60 minutes had to be geared toward how to do things, right? How to learn the fundamentals, and 40 minutes needed to be toward what to do, right? And again, understand that these are in controlled environments. This isn't out there in the world, and we're going to call it the game of life, amen? Okay, so here as we talk through these things, right, Pastor Wade, and when we talk about the points that we're going to bring up here, that's the what to do, all right? And then I'll do my best to bring behind the how to do them in what I feel the Lord was revealing to me. So if you can, open up your Bibles. If it's on your phone, if you have a physical one, please open up to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to start there. And I just felt the Holy Spirit tell me this morning, folks, we got to continue to get in our word. We got to crack this thing open. Okay. We got to open it because there's going to come a time, right, that these are going to be burned. Right. Then you won't be able to get them on your phone. Or if they're on your phone, they're going to say what the real Bible doesn't say. Right. And that's going to be Satan's way of getting us to divide us. Right. So it's important that you get in this word if, if you can open it up because we're going to have to download as much of it into our hearts. For that, for that day to come so that we can, we can stand against the things that are coming toward us. Amen? So here we are in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Just to give you a little bit of background, okay? The book of Acts was written by Luke, okay? You know, he already has a gospel. Luke was not one of the apostles or the disciples, all right? He came along later, and they say that he was one that followed, right? And, and his, his account in the book of Luke was actually him uh, sitting with Paul in jail uh, when Paul was jailed in Rome. And, and he was able to write it out, okay? If you guys know Luke, Luke was a physician. So when you read the book of Luke, it's very detailed in what he discusses because that was, that was just the way his mind worked, all right? He also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, and that, that's what the that full book is called, the Act of the Apostles, right? Because it captures what the apostles did after Jesus left this earth, 
right? In fact, earlier in, in the chapter 2, right, when they talk about the rushing wind coming, Jesus had left 50 days after, after Easter, right? That's, that, was, that was when Jesus was taken up. And then shortly after that, the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell on the people, all right? And so now they've all come together. Jesus is gone. They have the disciples. They have the apostles. And now they're trying to walk this thing out with, with Jesus gone, all right? And so we, we're going to take a snapshot here starting in verse 42 on what the church should look like. The first church, what it looked like, and it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, just like Devin said, right? Not the fear like I'm afraid, but reverence came upon them, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. Highlight that word, highlight that phrase, write it down. All who believed were together, highlight this one, underline this one, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had needed. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this moment. Father, we thank you that we are here, your, your spirit is here, that it's moving here because we need you lord we need your holy spirit in these end days and you are preparing us for the mighty work that you have so father i pray that you open our hearts you open our minds unto your word right now father i pray that you remove any distractions from me father you remove anything inside of me that's not of you let your word flow and speak through me to your people father so that you can stir and convict their hearts in order to go out there and act for you and be the church out there in the world we lord we, we, we ask that you take away any distractions here you let us to focus on your word, speak to your people, Lord, so that they can move and be filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we talked about knowing God, right, getting eye to eye. Now we're talking about following God, all right? And that, can, that happens in a few different ways according to what the word says. So again, the first thing, in order if we want to execute the blueprint that was given to us by the apostles in Acts, all right, the first point that we come on, come on is, number one, we need to continue to follow God through spiritual disciplines. Follow God through spiritual disciplines. In verse 42, he tells us, right, Luke tells us, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. Well, what are some of those spiritual um, um, practices and, and, and disciplines that we need? Number one is prayer. Right. If we are not praying and praying on a daily basis, we are not practicing the discipline that God called for us. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. Right. Who is our advocate. And then Jesus is our advocate to God. Right. So when we when we're praying and, and we're speaking and we're praying, and the Holy Spirit is coming upon us. That's when we kind of center ourselves. What's another one? Reading the word, just like Pastor Wade said. All right. In order for us to get the how to. Right? A spiritual discipline that we have to practice is reading the word every day. Just like with our football team or any sport that you play. All right? There's not one day that can go by where you cannot, where you where you're not, you should not be studying your place. All right? Because things change. You you wanna you wanna adjust things, you wanna get to the more neat, uh, detailed, nitty-gritty things. And if you're only looking at your plays once a week, Pastor Wade, yeah, those guys end up on the sideline with me and with Pastor Wade, right? Because it's not just our physical ability that's going to help us to be great when it comes time to the game, but we have to know what we're doing, right? So the Word of God is our playbook, folks, all right? Uh, hey, like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of books out there. Uh, Christian authors are writing them, right? And that's great, but the number one source is right here. Amen? Every day my boss tells me, oh, well, you got to read this book. It's called Ego is the Enemy. And I got to tell my boss, who's not a believer, I'm praying for him, for his salvation, okay? I tell my boss, I don't need to read that book because I read the Bible every day. And you know that book, Ego is the Enemy? The brother is actually saying plenty of the stuff that's already in the Bible. So maybe you should read the Bible. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Okay, so what I, like I say, I, I read other external sources and they're great, right? But this right here, we got to eat it every day. Meditate on the word day and night, Okay? Because like David said, I got to hide the word in my heart so that I don't what? 
so I don't sin against you. All right? And like I said, the days are coming, folks, when these will be burned in piles. Okay? You will be persecuted for having one of these. They're going to come and forcefully take it out of our homes, and they're going to burn it in the streets. And they, and they are going to try and wipe out any semblance of Christ. But that's what the word tells us is going to happen. Amen? So if you know that that's going to happen, we got to prepare. Right? We got to get our game plan. It's right here. And if we're only studying the playbook once a week on Sunday, right, reading the message on the board and say, oh, that's great. And then we don't get into it and keep breaking it down, then we're never, ever going to be ready for the game. Amen? Okay? So here's another one. This is important. Those spiritual disciplines. The number one spiritual discipline that we have to practice is we can only serve God and God alone. I'm going to say that again. The only thing and person that we got to serve is God and God alone. Can I get an amen? Okay? Because, and that's hard in this world. Here, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. All right? Jesus here speaking on the Sermon of the Mount, right? He's talking about, he spoke to the people about serving him or mammonas. Okay? It, it's not just riches. Okay? It's not just the physical aspect of wealth. Okay? But when you're worshiping mammon or mammonas, you create it to be an idol in place of God. Okay? You personify the chase of wealth, the desire for riches, and you want that over wanting God. Well, how does that, how, how does that manifest itself today? Well, I'm going to tell you this one. Okay? I'm going to hurt a lot of people's feelings today. Oh, I'm, I'm going. Okay? I'm going. The youth sports. Okay? I, I am a coach. All right? And again, I, I had to convict myself because I had an opportunity to coach a 12U team this year. I never coached Little League football in my life. Okay, I was always whatever. I did the college thing, and then I was doing the high school thing, and I tried to, I tried to insulate myself for the first six years of, of my tenure as, a, as a, a high school head coach because I just didn't want to be a part of it. I had heard things, but I've never seen it. You know, I dealt with, with high school kids and their parents, and I saw things that I was like, man, you guys don't know what you're talking about, but you make like you do. And you know what the saddest thing is that I see, church? Okay, is that there, there are adults using kids for their own personal gain in this world. Okay, you got people, and, and I, got, I got nothing against dudes that are trying to train and do all of this, okay? But they're creating businesses to charge kids to train them for their personal gain. But we mask it up in, I'm just trying to give back to the youth uh, but I got to get paid somehow, right? My wife would get on me all the time. You should go train. You can make so much money on the side. I, and I probably could, okay? But I can't do that because I can't see myself charging kids to do something that God allowed me to be really great at as a vehicle to put Jesus in their heart. I can't do that. I will never do that. But I see not just coaches, okay, parents, I love you guys, all right? My kid got to do this because he got to get one scholarship because that's how he's going to go to college. And you know what I tell parents when I have my meetings? Look to, your, look to your spouse because you made the decision on what type of scholarship they're going to get when you made baby with that person. But we think, but we want to push them and we want to invest in all of this and the only way they can go to college is through sports. No, it's not. You know, if you push them to be academically sound, there's actually more money in getting academic scholarships than there is athletics. But because we need to find validation in ourselves because there's a hole missing, we make it sound like I'm just pushing my kid to be better. I want him to have the best. No. You're putting something and you're willing to not come to church. You're willing to not go to group. You're willing to not read your word because I got to get my kid to college. Come on now. Come on, somebody. Let's get real. Ladies, I'm coming for you right now. <laughs> Ladies, I'm coming. Okay? Shopping addictions. Huh? Mm, got quiet over here. I'm going to get beat up here. I'm going to get beat up here. Right? 
Look at, look at, look at what's happened now. I can scroll through my phone. I don't even got to go to the mall no more. Okay? Before husbands, we could be like, let's just stay home. Okay? Now, hey, can we just go take a drive? I got to go to Target on the pickup side. And I'm in. Right? Hey, so convenient. Yeah? But it was only $3.99. Well, you bought 20 of them. And for what? Right? Again, we find reasons to justify the means when we're really just trying to fill something inside of us. Right? My big one, and I'm going to call myself out, is my career. My wife gets on me all the time. Like I said, I got to check my, I'm up here crying because I got to check my heart. Because you know what I say? God, if you just take me back to college and you let me be in the NFL, I'm going to have all this money and I'm going to do it to serve your, to serve your purpose. But yes, it's about me. Right? I, ha- I-, I had some things I'll talk about at the end. Even here in high school, I had to humble myself this past week and give up something because, and the whole reason, if I'm really, if I'm really honest with myself, the whole reason is because I want to go prove everybody that I'm the best in this, in this state. That I was tired of, of having people say, talk bad about me, and I'm going to prove everybody. I'm the best. Ain't nobody better than me. And guess what? God changed that real fast. But see, we make up these excuses, we create these gods in our lives, and we're not serving God, right? We make like we are, right? And we use spiritual ways to do it. God, this is for your kingdom, amen? This is for you, right? My son is going to go to college, and he's going to get this scholarship so that he can be a vessel for you. God, I got to buy this because I'm going to give it all away. Just like the, like, like the people did, like the church did in Acts 2, they, they gathered all their stuff and then they gave it away. Right? So, follow, and it's not easy. This is an everyday continual thing where we have to actively make a decision to serve God and God only. It's not just going to happen, church. It won't. It's an active decision to follow God every single day. The gift of salvation is free. Okay? That, the, the word says that. But working out that salvation, count the cost. Okay? And I think sometimes we don't do that. We want the front side of the blessing, but we don't want the back side of the blessing. Amen? Because with salvation, there is a cost. And it's not just, it's not just us as people. That's kind of what we've done in the Western church. We want to bring them in. Don't get me wrong. We want to bring them in. But we also got to guide them and let them know that after that first step, we got to stay in here and we got to keep it in tight and we got to help each other out because it ain't easy living countercultural, right? Again, culture is the enemy is Satan, right? He's had his hands on the culture from the beginning of time. Okay. Abraham and Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah, and, and all of that from the very beginning. Once we had the fall, Satan was able to have control over the culture of the world. Amen. Okay? And there is a small group, there is a small group of people trying to live it the way God set it in order in this Bible. And that's us. But we got to choose it every day. Amen? The second one is this. I spoke about it last time. We have to have fellowship with friends. And like I said in my last time I spoke, we need to create the correct definition of what a friend is to us. All right? It's not just and. and My wife and kids will tell you it's so irritating everywhere. We go even before I move back to Hawaii, right? We come home for vacation. So excited to be back home. We walk into one store, right? And they just, people stopping me. Abu, you think that, you know, I was gone for 10 years. Nobody knew me. You think I'd be able to walk into a store and, and everybody still remembered me. So, again, that can conflate my view of friends. Right? But like I said, in the Relational Intelligence book by Dr. Darius Daniels, he says a friend, when you have a friend, okay, there is an equal give and take in the relationship. Okay? Husbands and wives, our spouse should be our friend. Because every day we work and push and struggle to make sure that there is an equal give and take to help the other person be better. Amen? And if we're not in that place, then let's talk about it. Because that's what friends are. As we go and, and we analyze, if you go and analyze everybody that's your friend, okay, 
is there that equal give and take? Are they pouring into you just as much as you're pouring into them? Do they have, like they talked about, all things in common? That's, that's, that's how our friendships have to be created. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be associated with people that don't have the same belief system as me. What I'm saying is that your friend, your friends should be Christian. They should have a foundation and a base in this word because when you're down, they got to pick you up. The world doesn't know how to do that. You can be there for them. I have many non-Christian friends, and I'm willing to be there for them when they need me. But I myself am not going to ask them to be there for me because if I need advice, they're not going to give me godly advice. They're not going to tell me what I need to know, what I need to hear. They'll tell me what I want to hear, right? But that can lead me to the path of destruction. Okay, so it says here, in Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Okay? You might hurt some people's feelings. I'll give you a great example. My, my best friend from high school, all right, he was going through a rough time in his life. A few years, I was, I was still in the mainland. He was going through a, a divorce. Okay? I knew I was a great friend to him. Because I didn't tell him what he wanted to hear because that's what everybody was telling him. I told him what the word of God said. I said, my man, even though things is all messed up, you shouldn't. I love you. I love you to death and I'll always be there for you. But I think you're making the wrong decision. And we kind of separated for a little bit. But in the end, now we're still best of friends, right? Right? I still have to keep a boundary with him, but we have this flow where he's there for me and I'm there for him, and he still respects me. Even though he didn't agree with me at the time, he knew that I was willing to tell him the right thing. I, I didn't want to lead him astray. I don't want to be that wicked person. And understand this, you can be a believer and you can be wicked. Okay? Just because you know Jesus, just because you're sitting in this seat, it don't mean that you don't got some wickedness in you. Because trust me, I got a lot of it in me. So as, that's why we build the groups. That's what the group is for. That's what small groups are for. If you're not involved in a small group, you got to get in one. Because we cannot do this alone. Okay? You need somebody side by side with you that knows the struggles that you're going through. That you can link arms with them every day. And when you fall, they pick you up. When they fall, you pick them up. But they know, they understand the plight of not just living in this crazy world, but trying to do it God's way. Because that's the difference. Okay? We're all experiencing the same thing that everybody else is. But we're still trying to walk this thing out God's way. Amen? And so let's make sure that you're surrounding yourself, that the people that are side by side with you are those. They believe uh, they were all together and we have all things in common because I think that just that right there can change a lot in your life. Like I said, it's going to hurt some feelings. Okay. But if we can get to that and you, and those people walking side by side with you have that common thing together in Christ, then we can get through this world and be successful. Amen. The third one is this. We have to build our foundation through advisors. Okay, and again, taking this off of the book, uh, Darius Daniels, being an advisor, okay, for all of us OGs in the faith, doesn't matter how old you are, right? If, been, if you've been lock, walking with Christ a long time, right, there should always be somebody above you, okay? This is the discipleship piece that we talk about in the church, all right? But again, I think that we've, we, we haven't properly explained what having a, dis, a, being a disciple of someone, having an advisor uh, for us means, so here, in the book, Go and Make Disciples of All Nations, it says that discipleship, right, meaning having an advisor, meant much more than just a transfer of information. It referred to, get this, listen up now, imitating the teacher's life, inculcating his values, and reproducing his teachings. Therefore, Christian disciples, Christian discipleship, connotates a relationship with the master teacher following them 
and adhering to their way of life because their teaching shapes your own worldview. Okay? Who loves kung fu movies? Who has binge watched all of It Man? Okay? And that right there is the greatest picture that I can give you of what a discipleship or having an advisor. Hmm, master, I want to follow you and learn your ways. And they studied with that person every single day, right? But not just studied the art of Kung Fu, whatever, whatever. If you notice in those movies, right? It Man, most humblest guy, right? And he fought to teach his guys to be humble. Don't just go out there and fight in the streets, right? That's what we're talking about in that time in Hong Kong, right? Guys were just training all kinds of Kung Fu masters popping up. And they would just start raging in the streets. It was like back in the day when I was living in Merites and would have just straight hood fights in the middle of the intersection on Poor Lane. Just. <laughs> but if you notice in those movies, if you go back and watch, they all have the same, they all take on the characteristics and the trait of the person that they're following. Okay? Now we bring it into our biblical worldview. There were many, right? John the Baptist had his own disciples. Okay? When the 12 decided to leave their families, understand that that's what they were doing. When you, when you put yourself in a discipleship relationship with an advisor, you're saying that I want to learn the way you live. I'm going to imitate the way you do things because that is my dedication to you. And after you leave this earth, it's my responsibility to now take everything I learned from you and pass it on to the next generation. That's what... When we read that in the Bible, it's not just simply sitting down and going through the one-to-one -one book. That's not it. That's friendship. Okay? There is a level of respect and reverence for the person that you place as an advisor. Okay? And as the advisor, you understand the responsibility that you owe to this person that's following you. They're not there to provide friendship for you. Okay? When, when you go in and you choose somebody to be your mentor... They're not going to tell you the things you want to hear. You're allowing them and trusting them to tear down all of your beliefs. And you're going to follow what they do. How many of us have an advisor in our lives? How many of us? Let's be honest. It could be somebody in your group, but it shouldn't be somebody in your group. In my opinion, because you need it to be a person that has walked this thing out that lives the way that you, want, that, that you want to exemplify, all right, number one, their relationship with Christ has to be rock solid. They cannot be struggling with the same thing that you are. Because how, how, are, how are you ever going to get pulled up if the person is on the side of you? He's not going to pull you up. He's going to help you up. So we all need to go choose somebody, right? And, and, and it's not just in the Christian sense. In your professional life, Right? In the other things that you take on in this world, you should always try and go align yourself with somebody and say, you know what, I want to be like that person one day. So let me, let me sit at their feet and learn from them. And it says here, uh, Acts 2 verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Here's a big one. I'm going to tear everybody up right now. Buckle up your seatbelts because you're going to get mad at me, I promise. Okay? If you read through, after you get through the Gospels, okay, you're talking about 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all of the epistles, what you have to understand is those are letters, okay, from the Apostle Paul, helping and inspiring his church leaders out there how they should live their life, okay? They knew Christ, they're giving it to him, the Spirit is there, now what is the practical how-to steps in living your life? So as you read through those books, okay, understand that that's where it's coming from is the OG in the faith, no matter where he was, he put pen to paper, and he was telling the, he was mentoring every church outside of Jerusalem. That was his call. So here, in this letter exactly, to Titus, who was a very young leader, okay, at that time. I'm going to tell you this, you don't, you, age don't matter to be a leader, okay? Like we said, you got the fresh, fresh fire, you're willing to live your life right, you can lead anybody, okay? So in Titus, chapter 2, he tells the church this. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. 
the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Oh, we got some amens out there. Hold on now. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be shamed, may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. What does this all break down? Folks, we're not doing this. OGs in the faith, we're not doing this. We're not stepping up to be advisors. The word is clear. Paul is telling Titus to tell them because what was happening was there was a whole bunch of people popping up to be leaders in that church and telling them the wrong thing. That's why he keeps bringing up proper sound doctrine. Oh, geez, we're supposed to be teaching the next generation how to, how to live. God told me our problem is that we keep blaming it, that, oh, that's just this generation nowadays. No, this generation is that way that it is because we, namely men, don't take control of it. We just concede to the fact that, oh, social media and this is the way they are, and it's happened for generations. It didn't just start today because every generation before us said, oh, these new kids, ah, they, ah, ah, cha, cha. And we just write it off again to culture. Who is in charge of culture, folks? Who's in charge? Tell me. Satan is in charge of culture. So either we're going to take control of it or he's just going to run us off this earth. And it's going to be a bad, bad time. We already know from the book that it's going to be bad. But why are we making it worse? Because we're not willing to take over what God is rightfully telling us to do. Tom Landry, famous Dallas Cowboys coach. Kaleo, I love you. It's only because of you, my cuz. <laughs> you get what you demand. You encourage what you tolerate. I'm at practice some days, and my wife has to text me because I set these rules and parameters in place for my team. But my mind is always somewhere else, and she's holding me accountable to the little details. One of them is haircut, jewelry, and clothes attire. So we show up to scrimmages. Hey. You better tell this guy to change his shorts or else you've lost all credi credibility in my mind. And she's exactly right. We encourage what we tolerate. Just because I say it, just because I write it down on paper, right? Just because I say it once to you, it doesn't matter if I'm not enforcing it after. Paying, a paying attention to the little details. And that's what we don't want to do. That's what we as the church have gone to. Let me just go to church, praise God, accept him in my heart, and everything's good. No, man. The devil and the Lord is in the details. So I have a great example here in our church. In the Joash, Jen and JB. I love that my kids learn from them how to act, how to be, how to live. Because I know, I watched them walk now for six years being in this church, and I know that they follow what the Word of God says. They're not chasing followers on IG. They're not trying to be something that they're not. And you know what? It's reflecting in the kids that we're producing in this church. See, but us parents, right, and I throw myself in, the problem is, is we're still trying to chase our youth, people. We want to be young. But you know the problem with that is? Our kids are watching us, and guess what? They're only doing what we're doing. All of us trying to, again, oh, I'm just, and again, I'm not, IG, social media is a great thing, but know where your heart is when you're posting stuff. Is it for me? Are you checking your phone every five minutes to see who's hitting the like button? Because I'm guilty of it too. Or am I really trying to promote and move the word of God? Because if, if you're just doing this, on your phone all day, okay, and your kids are watching you, or if you're too busy with your job, that's me, watching football plays all day, and not teaching my own children how they should be handling our home, how they should be as, as a man and as a woman, then I failed. 
And while I'm gaining all of this temporary reprieve, right? And same thing with my, kid, my son. Dads, stay stern. Don't give in. There's a lot of things that I wish, when I, when I go back and sing the shoulda, coulda, woulda, now my son is a great, he's a great kid. But there's some things that because I was still working through the issues, right? I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the type of guy, I'm used to chaos. Okay, I'm a defensive player, right? I don't need structure in my life. When my feet hit the floor, boom, it's two-minute drill. I'm ready to roll. I don't get anything prepared before the next day, none of that. I don't make a plan, right? Okay, Lord, what do you want from me today? Got it. Boom. He calls the play. I'm out. I function well in that. Now I'm about to send my son off, and he has that poor habit because he's not prepared for the day. He was watching me for all these years. He still has all of the great qualities that I have, but there's also some of the bad stuff that I wish he didn't have in him because of me, not because of nobody else, not because of some dude on an Instagram, because of his dad. Husbands, that's why I support. Wives, it's the same thing. Memo Alpha, just having this discussion. If you have, a, if you have an involved parent set, husband or wife, the, the son ends up like the son, the wife ends up like the wife. So we got to be paying attention to the way that we act and interact with everybody and everything that we do in our life. We kind of just, quote unquote, hate the things in our kids, but not try and correct it. Because that's actually an indictment on yourself. But that's our job. And if we can do that, if we, and, and especially in the spiritual realm, okay, all of the YGs. I tell my wife, I love being old. I don't, I'm an old man. I'm only 38, but I'm an old man. I'm an old soul. I am fall asleep at 9 o'clock, try to get up early, right? Try to stay on a regular schedule, right? Now, now I'm concerned with different bodily functions that I didn't care about before. <laughs> Make sure, like, oh, that was, yeah, that was good. I'm going to have a good day. But I also, those that I'm in charge of, that I'm an advisor for, right? I do want them to exemplify my life. That's why I'm so attached to this book. Because I want them to be good husbands. I want them to be good fathers. I want them to care about the community at large around them and not only care about themselves. So if they have to tease me about having dad jokes, I'm good. I don't want to participate in their type of conversations because my mind is higher than theirs. They're babies drinking milk. I should be eating solid food. But sometimes we want to keep drinking the milk. And it's just poison that you're drinking, adults. Stop trying to be young already. Stop trying to be relevant. The Word of God tells us that we're supposed to be teaching the young men and the young women a way that's supposed to live. And it's countercultural. It's going to take some dealing with in your heart because it's different than the world lives. I'm okay with telling people that my daughter ain't leaving my house until she gets married. Because I have to keep my covering over her. I cannot just release her out there and not fend for herself. I'm okay in telling you guys that. My daughter knows that wherever we're living, that's where you're going to go to college. Because daddy's got to make sure that you're covered. Okay? Son is different. He's a man. He's got to go learn to be a man and learn how to protect his own family. I cannot keep him with me. But sometimes we keep the boy home and we send the girl away. How come? We cannot do that. That's not the order of God. Let him go grow up. But protect your daughters. Till the very end. And make sure that we're screening through who they're marrying. And, and the only thing I tell my daughter is this. He better be a good Christian man. That's it. That's the only requirement that we have. Because I know that if he's really, truly founded and rooted in Christ, God will add all of these things to him. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some time. But I don't need the tall, dark, handsome, athletic. She, she told me when she was five years old that she wants her husband to be a football player and a poet. <laughs> because she used to hear me serenade my wife with my makeup songs. <laughs> Even though she was rolling her eyes, my daughter thought it was sweet. Okay? But again, we got to break the culture. We're trying to participate in a world that we don't belong in. We don't belong in this world. Okay? Last one is this. I know I went over time. Sorry. I just get passionate, and I just want to help us play this game of life and be victorious. Because the devil is like St. Louis, and I want us to beat St. Louis every year. Okay? And Kahuku, and Mililani, and Campbell. 
Okay? That's all safety. No, 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 just joking. Edit this. Edit this. I love those guys. I love them. Okay? Last one is this. And we're going to hear about it as we go. You got to figure out your assignment. Okay? This world was not meant for us to only live for ourselves. And sometimes we get caught up in this world as a Christian that I got to fix myself first before I can go do what God has called me to do. That's not right. Okay? Uh, verse, 46, uh, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Uh, praise and worship team, if you could please come up. Okay, so assignment. All right, definition by Darius Daniels in that book I've been talking about. Uh, if you want, you can borrow it from me. It's a great one. You should buy it. Darius Daniels defines an assignment as a trainee, a mentee, or an advisee. A relationship that exists primarily for the purpose of one person providing mentorship, guidance, training, and coaching to another. Okay? So, as they get ready to play, this is something that I finally come to grips with, folks. You're going to have people in your life that you're going to be the advisor to that it's going to be a one-way relationship. You are going to be pouring everything out into them. You're going to be planting and watering seed, and you more than likely will not get a return on the investment. And that's where we screw up in this Western world. Because everything for us is rate of investment, rate of return. What is coming back to me if I invest in you? Jesus poured himself out to the point of death for the assignment that he was sent by, by God. But see, when, when we live in this self-absorbed world of it's only about me, we forget about what we're leaving behind. And we're not willing to stretch ourselves. We're not, let's call it what it is, we're not willing to be hurt by people that are assignments in our lives. I struggle with this. I pour out in my job I pour everything out even to and it's not healthy so I'm trying to get it corrected even at the detriment of my family taking calls at all all the time at night in the morning answering emails because I cared about these kids but see the problem was my heart was at a place where I'm going to give this all to them and they're going to say bro that's the greatest coach I ever played for and God told me and convicted my heart said that's wrong and for the first, first few years, I'm like, why aren't these guys thankful? When I was at college, right, it was different, mature men. They, they, were, they, they understood the return of investment that quickly came. Came down to high school, these kids were ungrateful. Parents were ungrateful. Giving up my own time. But God had to change my heart. So you want to talk about these steps? I'm only preaching this because I went through this this week. Humongous huge blowout had a defensive coordinator that resigned right and one week before we start camp so i instantly have to start moving things and like i said for me because i'm used to the chaos right god blessed me with a, a a beautiful mind or whatever i can make things changes and make moves really quickly but you know what it's all in my own strength but after some of the things i've been through before the first thing i did was i had to practice number one my spiritual discipline Immediately after he told me, I went into prayer. And it, wasn't, and, it, and it wasn't a good prayer. It was a pouty prayer. God, why are you doing this to me? You always do this to me. How come it can't just be easy? I worship you. I preach. I sing. How come it's so hard? But my wife encouraged me, said, you know what? God's going to give, God's going to put the people in place that need to be in place. I had a friend right here. Didn't even know what was going on. Call me up. The first thing we did was he prayed with me. So I know. I know we arm in arm. I have to lay it down myself. Like I said, I wanted to call the place because I'm really good. I, I, again, I don't stop. I'm just confident. I'm really, really good. Okay? I can out call and out scheme anybody. I'm telling you right now. But you know, my advisor... One of my advisors, who I seek from weekly, I meet with him weekly, said, you know what, Abu? Two things. He told me way back too when I decided that I wasn't going to listen to him. Okay? So I invested in me, okay, and I'm not listening to him. He said, you know what, Abu? I don't think that that's what God has for you. But I pushed it to the side. Exactly what he said came true this week. And on Thursday, he said, Abu, 
The reason you're a head coach, because I, I, I make no qualms about it, I want to move back up the ladder. And things would be so much easier if I could just be a position coach, or if I could just be a coordinator, if I could just coach football. And he said, you know what God told me? God keeps you in this position because he knows that this is the only way you'll ever need him. Whew, struck me to the core. Because he's right. Because I'm a confident, borderline, arrogant dude. I know in my own strength, I can do anything. I can do many things and be really good at it. But this keeps me in a place where I'm up here crying, folks. I can't hold it in because I, you know what? I'm not, I'm not built for this. But you know who's built for this? God is. And when you see, when they're talking about the spirit moving over the waters, I can't, I can't handle it by myself. Because at the end of the day, at the end, these the assignments that God has placed into my life, the 70, 200 kids or so, I owe them what God is asking me to do. And not only that, and this is where I've been shirking the responsibility, is I also have to mentor the men, the coaches. And I haven't been doing that. So it's hard. It's difficult. You think I want to tell a grown man what to do? In my mind, they should already know what to do. But that's wrong. And that takes growth and courage on my part. And I need God to handle it. So let's get up. Let's worship. Because we need the spirit to pour out on us. Because this is what God needs us to do. So right now, I just feel the Lord telling me, just, just lift your hands. Shut your eyes. Because in order for the spirit to indwell us, folks, there cannot be any sin. There cannot be any anger or malice toward anybody in our hearts. Because again... The Lord is calling you. He needs you to do the things we just talked about because the end is near. So I want you to just think about anything in your life that you're struggling with, any any uh, pilikia that you have with anybody right now. And we're just going to offer it up to the Lord because as soon as we take that stuff out and we give it up to him, you are going to be filled with this spirit because we got to go out there and we got to do this every day. So let's bow our heads. Dear our precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We worship your holy name. We thank you, God, that you have called us to live a way that is meant for eternal, eternal joy and happiness. Right now, Lord, we want to receive your spirit. But before we do, we just come with a spirit of repentance. We repent, Lord. Forgive us for the sins in our, in our heart, Lord, for the slandering of others, Lord, the malice toward others. Anything that we have done or said, Lord, in your sight that separates us from you, Lord, please forgive us. We lift it up onto you, Lord. We, we, we acknowledge that we cannot do anything without you. Father, we lift up those in our hearts that we might have issue with right now, and we just, we just lift them up. Lord, we, we pray that in your time, in your way, that reconciliation can happen, that wholeness can happen, Lord, so that they can see the love that you have taught us to love with. We ask you, you help us to forgive them. Lord, Father God, for whatever they have done for us, help us to release it. Lord, that our hearts may go from being a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, because that's what you want. Holy Spirit, speak to your people. You know who, you know who they need to be walking in friendship with side to side. Lord, you've placed in their heart who their advisor should be, and you've also placed in their heart, Lord, who their assignments are. I pray, God, that when your Holy Spirit fills them, that the, that the spirit of boldness will be upon them, that they won't be ashamed, that they'll humble themselves before you and they'll align themselves with what your word says. Father, we thank you for the families here. We thank you for the husbands and the wives. We thank you for the children. We thank you, God, that you have put them in our lives. We ask you, Lord, to just continue to cover us with your order and teach us the way that you want us to live. And not only that, but help us to show everybody how to do it. We worship you and we praise you and we love you, God. In Jesus' precious name and all the saints said, amen. Hallelujah. Give it up to God one more time. Thank you, worship team. You guys may be seated at this time. It's been a long time since I sat in a, through a message where I laughed so much and then got convicted so much all in, all in one time. And those moments of conviction is not to make you feel bad. It's to bring up something within you that God is trying to highlight where he wants you to make a change. He wants you to make an adjustment. He wants you to have something so that you can follow him 
hand in hand. And so sparked up next week's message already, which is discovering your purpose. And we're going to go heart to heart. Your passions, what you're passionate about. That comes straight from God. Don't miss next week's uh, message, the part three in our series. It's 1018. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings by honoring God. Our worship service is not just this, but is honoring him. So what he rightfully deserves. Let's pray together. Father, from this message, we can already apply. We cannot serve two masters. We're either serving you or we're serving mammon. And whatever mammon looks like in our in our lives as an idol, we put that down and we have an opportunity right now to be cut from that spirit by giving to you. Lord, we thank you that you use it to advance your kingdom and you set us free from the power of mammon. Lord, we thank you that you are our provider and you have more finances through an inflation era or a time of affluence in the corners of your lazy boy couch in heaven to provide for all of our needs. And we receive that as we follow you. You are God that provides. We thank you in Jesus name. And everybody says, amen. I want to prepare you for a sweet treat outside. Uh, it's not a sprint. Okay. We're, we're walking with God. Uh, it's not a, tra we're not trampling anybody. Like it was a wall, Walmart Thanksgiving Black Friday special. But Ray, my beautiful wife, is holding a beautiful baby. Happy birthday. And a ticket. Okay. And you receive the ticket, go outside, and you'll get a, a mini bowl. It's like a mini, mini bowl. Okay. So you can't get many of the minis. You get one bowl as you go. Let's all stand up. Wait. Wait a minute. Sit down. That was a test. And we went over time today, and I wanted to see who was ready to run out of here. Because I know you got things to do. I want to say one more thing, okay? Growth Track has been awesome and amazing. You can pop in if you haven't gone through our hope. We're going to keep it as a cycle. So jump on in. I believe we're in week two of it. So please go ahead and go through our growth track. It is the foundations and the fundamentals of what we are all about. We want to walk this thing out and we're walking into the the end days you need to be prepared and you need to know how to live out this word and through this growth track that is part of the process um, i think there's a couple more spots for our freedom weekend with our ladies on july 35th which is a saturday you find Ray to sneak into that class, and they capped it at 20. But if you drop my name, they might take it to 24. 20, 12, 12 disciples, 12, 12, 24. Can you extend this a little? This, it almost filled up like in four minutes. And so, yeah, there's a couple more spots left. So go ahead and uh, sign up for that, ladies. And then, men, when we challenge you, we're not going to have to, we're going to have to have more. We need to, we have to lead strong. And so I'm not going to cap it at 20. Okay, we're going to have 40. 40 40 year olds in the house. 40 plus. Go stand up. I was buying time for the bags. There's so many people in here. I was like, oh, the bags is taking a long time. Thank you. Just receive this blessing today. Receive this word today. It's a powerful, transforming word today. And I'm glad that we had a little extra sauce today. So we're not just going through the motions anymore, that we're literally going to grab Jesus' hand and walk with him. And there is a way, there is a process of how we can live this thing out. There's handles to this thing. And so, Father, as we go today, we walk with you hand in hand. We thank you for this powerful word of knowing that you're going to put people in our lives that are ahead of us, that will pull us up and call us to greatness, and let us humble ourselves so that we can do that, Father. We thank you so much for this timely word. Help us bless those that are around us and share that fresh, fresh fire, but maybe not share that sweet treat that is outside. That's all for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Aloha, aoi, ho. Malama pono.